We're gonna try out the Honda Moto Compacto. Hopefully I don't crash. This thing is surprisingly zippy. It like really gets up and goes. That's fun. Thank you. Welcome to the 2024 Chicago Auto Show, the first major auto show of the year. So today we're gonna check out some of the coolest vehicles that are coming to market this year, some new debuts, some concept vehicles. Let's go see what's out there. The entire show is actually on this half of the convention center this year. Sometimes they have two halves, but all the manufacturers are here. They have different size booths with different number of vehicles. When you first walk in, you see Ford and we have Toyota. So let's just kick off with Ford. Front and center, we have the Mustang S650, a Mustang convertible in yellow, but there is a much, much cooler version of the Mustang, a little bit further back, which that's what I'm really interested in seeing. The Raptor R puts the supercharged Shelby GT500 5.2 liter V8 into the off-road Focus truck. Remember the previous Raptors ended up going to the twin turbo EcoBoost V6. The Raptor R is just truly an epic machine. This refresh brings some changes to the front end. We've got different DRLs there, it is just a, a mild mid-cycle, and the taillight design has also changed. And another thing, the graphics pack has changed. Remember the one that I had that was code orange? So you have the code orange R accent. So if an orange truck, it would say either Aptor on one side or, Rap, or Rapto on the other side, because the, the orange R would blend in. But now it's a different contrast there, and they've got the orange accent R down there. So that's, that's another slight change. This is still such an epic truck. Put in rear-wheel drive mode, you have yourself like an off-road rally drift monster. We have ourselves a Bronco Raptor in eruption green with the signature orange amber front lights. This is also such a fun, fun off-road vehicle. And then you have the little sibling, the Bronco Sport there. And front and center in the Ford booth, the Mustang GTD, which we got to see last fall in Monterey when it debuted. This is the most extreme street legal Mustang ever. GTD, GT Daytona class, this is literally a race car for the road. It is tremendously wide. Look at those fenders, the carbon fiber construction that keep weight down. The number of race derived features that are fully functional on this machine are staggering. We have magnesium wheels for lighter weight, carbon ceramic brakes. You can see the arrow. Look at those front fender vents, the front splitter, the canards. And then around back, we have this giant C-pillar mounted adjustable rear wing. So this has active aero, it has a DRS mode, drag reduction system, where the wing will move. Massive diffuser. We have uh, inboard suspension that's adjustable. So you can change the suspension ride height from when you're on the street to when you're on the track. Super sticky track tires and, oh yeah, power, right? It has a lot of it. A supercharged 5.2 liter V8, similar to the one in the GT500, but making over 800 horsepower. This is gonna be expensive. For a Mustang, it's over $300,000 starting price. It's gonna be extremely difficult to get, but the performance levels, the design, the rarity, I mean, just look at this thing. You could own a Daytona class race car for the road. And as somebody who has owned a couple Mustangs, and obviously I love them quite a lot, this may be one of the ultimate iterations of a Mustang. 300 grand though, so you're going up against things like GT3 RS. I mean, this could probably go toe to toe with like a McLaren 765 LT, a Huracan STO. We're talking complete supercars, but from Ford Performance. Yeah, that's gonna be really cool. I really wanna drive one of those at some point. This is something else from Ford Performance that's also really cool, the Lightning Switch Gear. So it's essentially a concept kind of prototype test vehicle where they took an F-150 Lightning and modified it extremely. You see it's much, much wider. To me, this is like if Ford Performance did a Raptor version of the Lightning. It's got uh, the upgraded shocks, the three inch Fox uh, shocks that like the Raptor has. It's all electric still. The Lightning is all electric and clearly they got it very dirty, so they used it. You can jump it, do all sorts of wild things with this. It is significantly wider. If, if Ford did an electric Lightning, or electric Raptor based on the Lightning, would you buy one? Would you want it? I still think I'd go for the Raptor R because supercharged V8, right? But this is definitely interesting. Silent off-roading is weird. I did it in the Hummer EV and when you don't hear anything, all the other noises are so much more amplified. 
We've got the Mustang Dark Horse, which we also got to drive to me like a spiritual successor to the uh, Boss 302, Laguna Seca that I had, the ultimate iteration of a Coyote platform. And also this paint is so cool. The flake is pretty amazing. You can order carbon fiber wheels on this car. It is the ultimate Coyote iteration. And it was the top S650 Mustang until that GTD came out and kind of blew this away completely. But I liked it, I liked it, not enough to want to replace like my 350R with one of these, the Dark Horse. I still think the Shelby is a little more special, but it is still a really, really capable car. And other news, we have the refreshed Ford Explorer. So we have new front grille, fascia, new lighting. This one here is the Explorer ST. So I believe this technically is top of the line trim. The Platinum goes a little more luxury. ST is the sporty one. So you have bigger wheels, brakes. You can see red brake calipers peeking out there. Got some more sporty characteristics and refreshed bumper lighting, LED signatures there. This paint has a lot of metallic flake to it too. Blacked out badging. On the inside, it looks like we have some changes to the infotainment screen there. I believe Blue Cruise is now available here on this Explorer. And then around back, the taillights change. Yep, some slight refreshes there too have the quad exhaust tips for the Explorer ST. I'm sure I get to spend some time with us at some point. My parents actually have a pre-refresh Explorer Platinum and I think my mom likes that. And here we have the new Ford Ranger Raptor coming very soon. So the Raptorized version of the midsize truck. You have the Maverick as a little one, F-150 up top, and then the Ranger. It sits nicely in the middle. This is five inches wider than a regular Ranger. Not as wide as an F-150, obviously, smaller truck, but it's got a longer wheelbase than the Bronco. It is shared with the Bronco. It's a lot of similarities. So the same three liter EcoBoost V6, 405 horsepower, but again, slightly longer wheelbase. This one has the 2.5 inch Fox racing shocks, whereas the Bronco Raptor, the Raptor has the three inch, but you see a lot of the same rugged off-road focused traits. We have the side steps there. We have actually new BF Goodrich KO3 tires, kind of got those beadlock look wheels there, a little bit more suspension travel. And in a smaller, lighter vehicle, that 400-ish horsepower out of that 3-liter EcoBoost V6 will be plenty. When I drove the Bronco Raptor, I had a ton of fun. And the crazy thing is, MSRP starting price is going to be in the 50s range, probably mid to upper 50s, but that's a pretty compelling price point. More typical Raptor touches inside. We have the orange accents here, more heavily bolstered seats. Looks like we've got drive modes. We have uh, front and rear locking diffs. Then really nice digital cluster. Ford is doing a really good job with all the startup animations and also when you change drive modes. I have a vertical screen there. Raptor steering wheel with the nice paddle shifters too. And you have a decent sized bed back there and actually a good amount of space here in the second row seat. So the Ranger Raptor, I am definitely looking forward to driving this. The Raptor range is pretty badass. Off-roading, conquering all sorts of terrains, even driving normally. I think the trucks are a little better for daily driving, just simply because they seem to be a little more enclosed, smooth and comfortable, longer wheelbase. So that's a nice look at the Ford display here at the Chicago Auto Show. I will say Ford is doing a fantastic job with enthusiast vehicles. Look at the entire Raptor range we just checked out, the new Mustang generation, the racing iterations, the Mustang GTD over here, the dark horse, stuff like the lightning switch gear, right? That's trying to embrace electrification, but still for enthusiasts. We have ourselves a Maki bronze here, which that eruption green does look quite nice. It's got all sorts of bronze accents there on the wheels, Maki rally, and F-150 refresh. The tre ooh, this looks badass. This is the Tremor. The Tremor is like, I call it the low calorie F-150 Raptor. It's got a lot of the characteristics, but it's not quite as wide and ridiculous. So it makes it a little more well-rounded and usable in day-to-day. -day. Toyota's making some good enthusiast cars too, for sure. Ooh, look at that blue. Look at that blue. I like it. It's kind of like Rapid Blue or the uh, Grabber Blue from the Mustangs. That is bright. I still have not driven one of these yet. And I, I want to, because I've heard really good things about it. Obviously it's really popular. Also auto show thing, they have to remove all the shift knobs because sometimes people steal them apparently. So that would have a shift knob if you order one. 
But man, this blue looks good. GR Corolla. Yes, the Prius does look amazing. I feel weird saying that, but the Prius looks properly good and has also been very well reviewed. Honestly, the Prius does its job so well. If you want a efficient vehicle that is practical, it's reliable, these things go hundreds of thousands of miles with like taxi cabs and stuff like that. Um, yeah, it, it really just does its job so well. It gets a lot of hate because probably enthusiasts don't like them because it's kind of everything we don't stand for if you like big, massive V8s. But from an engineering car design standpoint, Prius is, I hate to say it, a good car. This is the Crown Insignia, so they're adding more to the Crown lineup uh, crossover. This car was named after somebody just threw some Scrabble tiles on the floor, the BZ4X, Toyota BZ4X, it's a pure EV. The refreshed new Camry, so new styling, plenty of hybrid powertrains, also a prototype vehicle's locked, so you can't sit inside. But look at the front end. You see a lot of those Prius design cues too with the, the lighting. I'm just waiting for the internet comments to say that looks like an SF90 up front, which is that really a bad thing? I think it's a bad thing for Ferrari. Anyways, this looks quite nice too. So in this segment with things like the Honda Accord, the Hyundai Sonata, uh, just they still make cars. A lot of the American manufacturers have given up on cars. They're all crossovers, right? They don't make sedans anymore. And for like my family, we still have a car because it just works well. We don't want a crossover. So here is the newest 2025 Toyota Camry. I'm sure we'll see these all over the road because they sell well. Here we go. The new Land Cruiser, which is back after I think a three year hiatus. It's slightly smaller, a little bit narrower, not quite as long, but still brings what the Land Cruiser is known for. Legendary reliability, off-road capability, and it comes in a couple different flavors. Interestingly, they have two like different front ends. You have different front end designs where the headlight actually changes completely. I think I actually like the other one, which is more kind of like square Tetris looking. But here we go, the new Land Cruiser. If you go abroad, like every time I'm in the Middle East, right, UAE, Dubai, there are Land Cruisers everywhere. They absolutely love them there, so. A couple more specific details on the new Land Cruiser. So it's 4.4 inches narrower, 1.2 inches shorter than the outgoing generation, and it's sharing platform with the Tacoma, so same powertrain. It's a hybrid 2.4 liter four-cylinder that makes 326 horsepower and 465 pound-feet of torque. It'll start in the mid 50k range, so it's a nice price point, nice size. I definitely want to try out one of these. Hyundai's display here is a bit more on the normal side, just vehicles parked here. You compare that to over at Ford, they've got this test track thing for the Bronco to climb up that big hill. And you see you've got this eruption green Bronco coming down. It's always pretty cool. We can experience the vehicles here inside of the auto show. But back to Hyundai, what do they have here? We have the Refresh new Santa Fe, which from a styling standpoint, I love what the entire Hyundai Genesis Kia group is doing. They actually have really refreshing new kind of daring designs. Look at this. You can see some of the Ionic 5 cues. I see them from the lighting signature where they have like little squares and I keep thinking it looks like Tetris, right? That's what it reminds me of. But very boxy iteration here on the Santa Fe. Here we have the refreshed new Hyundai Sonata. This one is the N-Line, so it has the top tier 2.5 liter turbo four making 290 horsepower. Really sleek new styling of the big light bar across the entire front end. It's a good looking sedan for sure, especially with the N-Line treatment. You see we have the end center caps here on the wheel. Hyundai trying to build out like a little sportier sub-brand kind of similar to what uh, the German brands would have too. Quad exhaust tips, refresh the taillights here too. Yeah, I'm a fan of the uh, Hyundai style, except actually wait, I'm a fan of all the Hyundai styling on their new stuff, except for the Ionic 6. Ionic 6 just looks a little weird to me. This is the new Kona, I believe. This, the back end looks like it's a mix between a Beetle and sort of a 911 and just, it's aerodynamic apparently, and I haven't driven one yet, but I prefer the styling of the Ionic 5 by far over there. Next we have Chevrolet. We have a Cacti Trax here. We have a Chad there putting a box together, doing something. He's not listening. Hi, Chad. Bye, Chad. Hey, dude. We have the Colorado ZR2, Silverado ZR2, which looks nice and aggressive here. We have the, oh man, the ZR2 heavy duty, yeah. Whew, 
I haven't gotten to drive one of these, but I did get to off-road the Sierra version, GMC AT4X AV, and it felt like I was driving a dinosaur. It was just massive. We have the Refresh New Traverse, which we got to check out, uh, I believe, already. Much more aggressive styling, much more like SUV-like from the front end to the side and everything like that, much more squared off. We have the Equinox here too. These are outgoing models. Yeah, this is what I'm looking for. See around the corner, the C8 Corvette. We have the regular Stingray here. And in the middle, we have the best one, obviously, the C8 Z06 with the carbon wheels, Z07 Aero, and finished in Seawolf Gray. Seawolf is this metallic gray. At first, it reminded me of Nardo, but it's got a lot of metallic flake to it. I'm still preferential to my Rapid Blue, but Z06. And then we have the E-Ray, zero to 60, two and a half seconds, first ever electrified Corvette, first ever all-wheel drive Corvette. Having driven the Z06 extensively and tracked both the Z06 and the E-Ray, my preference is still the Z06, NA, rear-wheel drive. The E-Ray is a more well-rounded, daily drivable sports car, all-weather traction, drove it on the all-season tires, and actually they were pretty impressive too, but it's a very different personality, much more uh, blunted, I guess, not the sharp scalpel of the Z06. It doesn't rev out as high with the LT2. It is plenty powerful and torquey, but the other way I explain it is this is like a 911 Turbo S. That is a GT3 RS. So you kind of see the personality differences, both really cool in their own way. So it kind of depends what kind of experience you want to go for with your mid-engine Corvette experience. Here at Nissan, we have something really cool. We have the refreshed Rogue here, but Check out this Aria. This is no ordinary Nissan Aria. First of all, just look at it. It looks like a Hot Wheels in real life. We've got 39 inch snow tires on this thing because this vehicle drove from the North Pole to the South Pole. 10 months, they drove this vehicle over 30,000 kilometers and the modifications include obviously the massive snow tires, the suspension lift, the fender flares, but the other stuff is largely stock. So the powertrain, the batteries, everything like that, it was to prove that they could do it. But 10 months to drive from North Pole to South Pole in an all electric Aria, they were testing out all sorts of different uh, ways to regen and like prototype things um, to charge the battery out there, whether it's a little wind turbine or like solar power stuff. So this is a really, really cool project. So obviously Nissan had it on display here with the Aria. I think they should make this into the Aria Pro 4X. It's no more ridiculous than when they made the Juke R, right, with a GTR powertrain. That would be cool. Is there a GTR though? No. I think just the Nismo Z, which I think looks way better than the regular Z. They changed the front fascia a bit, much more aggressive little side uh, aero pieces, much stickier tires, different wheels. I, I still wish it came with a manual transmission. I spent some time with the new Nismo Z. So there is a review and a vlog on the channel. Make sure you go check that out. Here in the back of the show, there's this test track with a bunch of different EVs. And in the corner, we have the updated Tesla Model 3, but we also have what is arguably the most viral vehicle out there right now, the new Tesla Cybertruck. Some of the claims, we have the stainless steel exterior, shatter resistant glass, 2,500 pound payload, 11,000 pounds of towing power, adaptive air suspension. You've seen a lot of this thing on the internet. Everything from it struggling to off-road maybe to some dude driving it while wearing his Apple uh, Vision Pro. This is my first time getting up close with one and yes, the refrigerator stainless steel construction um, don't get your fingers caught in the front trunk. The styling is absolutely just, it's hard the process that a vehicle like this made it to production. All right, I'm here. I had to at least just sit in it. Oh man, that is a big screen. I've heard good things people said about the build quality though. This is the foundation series. Actually, everything seems pretty solid right now. Yeah, okay. Big screen, very nice graphics. Look at that. Can I drop it down the entry? Oh yeah, it's lowering. Anyways, they probably don't want me messing with this thing. First look at a Foundation Series Tesla Cybertruck. 
Still waiting to see one of these on the road. I haven't personally seen one on the road yet. It's gotta look even weirder out there. The Cadillac Escalade IQ, the full electric version of the Cadillac Escalade. We have done a background video with this. We've seen it up close. The executive rear seating package there. It's got rear wheel steering, plenty of power, the massive 55 inch curved screen inside, a front trunk, and still, you can tell it's a Escalade, but it's evolved a little more sleek. You have the modern lighting up front. The startup animation on the lights are really cool too. So check out the full Escalade IQ walk around that I did. Looking forward to driving one of these and seeing what it's like. We have ourselves a Lyric and you see the family resemblance from the front end styling. Honda's big news debut is this car, which is actually built in collaboration with General Motors. So it's on the GM Ultium platform, all electric. So it's related to the Blazer EV. They've got single motor front wheel drive or all wheel drive with dual motor options. The front wheel drive one makes 212 horsepower, 296 miles of EPA range. The all wheel drive one ups the power to 288 horsepower, 281 miles of range, $48,000 starting price, I think right around there. So this is interesting. I personally, I guess it makes sense so they can add a vehicle to the lineup, but when it's platform shared with well, something like the Blazer EV, to me, it seems like immediate competition, right? But it's a Honda take on it. From what I recall, the Blazer gets a bit better in terms of range ratings. But if you're looking for a Honda version of a Blazer EV, this is the Honda Prologue. And then we have the Civic Type R, which I haven't driven this gen. I drove the previous gen one and honestly, one of the best front wheel drive handling experiences I've had. And then that's that's a Honda I'll take. I'll, I'll, take, a, I'll take a Honda Jet, please. They like bringing this to, seen this at a couple different shows. It's missing the wings, but yes, if you'd like a private jet, Honda has you covered. Let's see how spacious this looks. Actually, not bad. Four seats there, a fifth one there. I don't think this has a bathroom. Controls up front. Kind of like the size of a, a Phenom maybe. Here we have the first ever all electric Acura, the ZDX with the Type S. This is supposed to be 60 to 70 grand, targeting about 325 miles of range. But the thing that really stood out to me, look at the lack of wheel gap. The suspension actually is sitting really, really low. I'm a little, little bit surprised for like a crossover wagon, but it does look quite nice. Across from Honda and Acura, we have the BMW stand, the only German manufacturer to still come to the Chicago Auto Show and bring some vehicles. So right here we have a plug-in 5 Series. This would be the, the names are getting complicated, the i5 eDrive 40. Uh, we have ourselves an X5, the 7 Series, which I don't like the styling, but the interior is properly amazing. The one I drove had the theater rear seat package, the front end with the massive screens here too, the ambient lighting. The materials and design inside are just truly, truly impressive for a flagship executive luxury sedan like this. Of course. Nope, oh, wait. I didn't do it right. Soft closed doors. There we go. It's got like power closed doors too. So the new 7 Series is really, really impressive. We have ourselves an X7 with an M4 in pretty crazy shade of frozen purple. This did just get a refresh. I believe there's a slight update. This looks like to be the outgoing one. So not the completely updated version of the M4 2024. So they changed the headlights slightly from what I recall seeing. And then we have the X2, which I actually think I saw over in Japan at the uh, Tokyo Mobility Show, Japan Mobility Show, whatever it was called. Uh, that's where they debuted it. But this is probably one of the first times it's here in North America. And now I believe BMW has filled X1 through seven. You can get X1, X2, three, four, five, six, seven. So uh, whatever number you wanna pick, you can go for it. The odd numbers are usually the more kind of conventional size ones and the even numbers. So I think X4 or X6, they give it that kind of swoopy sport back look to the crossover treatments. So over here at Buick, we have the Invista, which we got to drive when it first came out. And honestly, at the price point under $30,000, this is a very competitive and impressive premium little crossover. And yes, 
from certain angles, it does kind of look like a budget Lamborghini Urus, but I, I liked it. It was really good for especially under 30 grand, given how much everything costs these days. And then from Buick, we come over to another one of the sister brands in the GM portfolio, GMC. And this is really cool. The Earth Cruiser built off of the full electric Hummer EV. So the entire shell is carbon fiber. It's got onboard solar power. So you take the already pretty capable, massive, ridiculous over the top Hummer and turn it into this overlanding setup. So you see the tent pops up there for a bed. This is where the shower is. So it's got like an outdoor shower. And with a vehicle like this, right? It's really trying to maximize every single inch of space. So they had to do a lot of really cool stuff to make it work. You see the Hummer multi-function lift gate open there that functions as a step. Got it open up there. And then we can take a quick look inside. It's got the bed up there, little kitchen area. I believe they said there was like a toilet there too. So this is uh, interesting. I They don't have pricing released. I, I can't imagine it's cheap because carbon fiber construction and everything it takes to make it fit. But if you don't want to tow a trailer or something, this is definitely pretty interesting. Earth Cruiser built on a Hummer. We've got Lexus here and they have a couple all new models that are definitely interesting. Ooh, LC, I still love the LC 500. We have the Lexus TX, three row crossover, replaces the RXL. Uh, but it's a full-size crossover here, plenty of new tech, luxury, design, hybrid powertrains, and so forth. But over here, this is what's really cool, the GX550. I know a lot of people have posted reviews of it from the first drive. I haven't had a chance to drive one yet, but first look at the Lexus GX550. So the GX brings a really boxy and modern design to it. Got a lot of sharp lines. It's got one powertrain right now, a 3.4 liter twin turbo V6, making 349 horsepower, 479 pound-feet of torque. There will be a hybrid one coming later. 10-speed auto, standard four-wheel drive across all the trims, three-row full-size luxury SUV. And the big other news was the Overtrail, which is like the most off-road focused one. But before that, let's take a look at the interior. We have fixed side steps here big interior screens. I definitely need to spend some time with the GX550, see what it's like. The Overtrail one is actually really, really cool. It's got really uh, extensive suspension upgrades. It can like disconnect the anti-roll bars, upgraded tires and wheels, the locking diffs, uh, all the different drive modes too, transfer case. It has a lot of really cool stuff. So that is the all new Lexus GX550. Volkswagen has this 1967 21 window bus on display because they've got this, the new VW ID bus. They're bringing back the VW bus in electric form. So it's rear wheel drive as standard with available all wheel drive, seat seven passengers. It has no competitors because this is the first all electric van like this. The styling is super cool. Range should be pretty decent and the price point $40,000 ish price point is what I saw. Check out this interior. Relatively minimalistic, but it looks like pretty nice materials. Super spacious. Huge panoramic roof. Cool different textures, colors here too. A little window there. Sliding side doors. Yep, they are powered. The two tone color is also nice and fun. So yeah, it is, it is like a minivan bus of sorts, but all electric and you have the iconic history. Storage bins down here. So practicality is big, but this thing is actually pretty cool. Like when I first saw it, I was like, I'm actually kind of excited for this. It's definitely unique. The Volkswagen ID Buzz. Got an old Beetle here too. And then somewhere there should be a, oh, 75 years in America with a Volkswagen. 23 million Beetles sold worldwide. Does that include Porsche 911s? Haha, uh -huh, just kidding. The Kia stand here. We have the EV9, the all-electric three-row SUV, which I've heard some really, really good things about. Styling is definitely quite cool. So this would probably compete against something like the Rivian R1S or anything else in this space. Full electric. Look at that lighting signature. The new Kia logo. They're doing some really, really cool things with the design. And the interior too. Wow. 
Wow, there's two of them here. This is a matte silver paint, which is also quite impressive that a relatively mainstream manufacturer is doing factory satin and matte finished paints like that. That's pretty, pretty special. In the past, I remember you had to order like a pretty high-end car in order to get a matte finished paint. So maybe paint technology has advanced to allow them to do that. We have ourselves the EV6 GT, which is the most potent, powerful version of the all-electric little crossover here. It's always impressive too, the amount of aero that they do, right? Aero is super important on an electric car. That's what really impacts the range. They gotta maximize the amount of miles you can run on that given battery size. So things like the, the flush door handles and so forth. EV6 GT brings some little lime green accents too. Lime green brake calipers on this one. What else does Kia have? They just launched the slightly refreshed K5 and I believe the Carnival also has an update. The, not a minivan, the MPV, you don't call it a minivan, right? I did actually spend some time with one, I liked it. The new K5, that orange DRL signature, pretty sharp and aggressive. Spent the week with a K5 GT line, thought it was pretty nice, essentially replaced the Optima. Although I am sad about the Stinger going away because the Stinger was really, really cool. So the K5 GT, nice sedan in the segment. And then over here, we have ourselves the Carnival. You can see Kia's doing with their like daytime running lights, it's getting really like almost like lightning bolt jagged where it's extending out all sorts of different directions, intruding onto the grill area. It's a cool way to refresh their styling and their um, DRL is always this like orange tint to them. So that's always uh, pretty distinctive. Let's take a look at this one. So you see how the seat can go inboard, it reclines all the way back like that. The leg rest will come down. Check out the, uh, I did a review on one. I spent a week living with the Carnival. I felt like I could almost live inside of it. Minivans aren't, people hate on minivans, but I think they can be kind of cool. And now we enter the forest of Subaru. Every year at the Chicago Auto Show, Subaru builds essentially a nature preserve and it's absolutely wild. Like. If you know anything about how much it costs to put on stands and displays like this, this is so immersive and cool. And they bring puppies, but the puppies might be taking a nap. They, they can come play with puppies that are up for adoption at the auto show. But the cars, the cars, the cars. Honestly, I think the display is, is even more impressive than the cars. Live plants in enhanced fragrance area. Like, you saw some of the other displays I brought you to. Look at this one. This is crazy. There's like a tree house. Uh, we have the updated Forester here. This digital screen too. You hear nice calming forest sounds. It's a whole experience here. It's a really, really cool way to activate. Whoa, it's a, that's a little bit trippy as you transition from normal to this. Redwood National Park. And it makes sense for them to do something like this because it really aligns with their buyers. They know what their buyers care about, what they're using the vehicles for. So that is quite cool here at the Chicago Auto Show. Although this is like giving me a little bit of motion sickness. Love, it's what makes a Subaru, Subaru. Look at this statistic. 96% of Subaru vehicles sold in the last 10 years are still on the road today, along with a very old Forester. That is quite an impressive Claim. And then we have this one here, top safety pick, which obviously is important for occupant safety. This vehicle, is, that's a pretty uh, compelling way to demonstrate your safety with a crumpled up Forester. So Subaru, really, really cool display here at the Chicago Auto Show. We'll go ahead and finish our tour of the Chicago Auto Show with the Supercar Gallery. Every year, a couple of the dealers bring some pretty crazy supercars to display, starting with this hypercar. The Lamborghini Countach LPI 800 Hybrid V12, outgoing based on the Aventador platform. We are getting the Revuelto soon, but still pretty cool to see a Countach. Last year they had that super crazy tennis ball lime green colored one. We have the Huracan Storado, end of the V10 Lambos, the off-road go anywhere all-terrain. I, I love this thing. If I had a lot of money, I would try to get one because just imagine an all-terrain supercar. It's got the V10. You can go anywhere you want. Snow, mud, sand, dirt, whatever. This is like super appealing to me. The STO, pretty much a, a road legal race car. Uh, after I drove this, my R8 felt like a wet sponge, but these are pretty hardcore. 
We have an Urus S. We have a really interesting Cullinan spec. It's like a almost army green with the orange pinstriping. Maserati MC20 Cielo, the new Gran Turismo. We'll be spending time with both of these Maseratis soon in the next couple weeks. Continental GTC. We have ourselves a Phantom. Oh man, look at this Phantom interior. The yellow and white spec. That is bold. And then we have a Ghost. The Spectre, the new all-electric Rolls-Royce Spectre. Two-door only, kind of a replacement for the, the Wraith. It is massive. Wow, this is, this is actually a lot bigger. Oh, there's a Dawn right there. This is substantially bigger than the Dawn. The front end feels taller, looks taller. Still iconic Rolls-Royce styling with the grill, the spirit of ecstasy up front. This Dawn spec is also quite nice. Uh, what's back here? Continental Flying Spur. Absolutely love those. I love the headlights and taillights on the latest generation of the Bentleys. The crystal look is just so gorgeous. Look at that. That's awesome. I drove a GTC Speed, the W12, out in uh, Monterey during one of their test drives, and I liked it a lot, but it was also $400,000. So, yeah, these are it's a supercar gallery. It's the expensive cars. On the other side, we've got a couple McLarens from McLaren Chicago. Artura Hybrid Twin Turbo V6. The new 750S, which is the mid-cycle update on the 720. Pulls a lot of stuff from the 765 LT and puts it into the regular Super Series. You can see the big wing that uh, looks like it pulled straight from the 765. New exhaust and so forth. Interior also updates from the Artura, from the active panel controls, which are now like above the wheel as CarPlay now. Lotus Amira, oh yeah. They need to like figure out how to get these things sold. Like, because I think they're still waiting for the CARB or like national NHTSA approval or something or another, they're not federalized. So they're just waiting, but I love this thing. Manual, supercharged V6, absolutely love the Amira. Someday I wanna buy an Amira because it's just such a good driving experience. Another MC20 Cielo, a couple of Astons, another Spectre, oh look at that. That one's in uh, a gray. You can see from the side profile, Spectre versus a Wraith. It does look a bit bigger. That concludes the supercar gallery at the auto show this year. With that, we have walked the entire show floor here at the 2024 Chicago Auto Show. You'll notice some brands are not here. Stellantis did not attend, so none of the Stellantis brands, Jeep, Dodge, Ram, any of them are here. Uh, some of the other German brands, Audi and Mercedes do not come in display. So the auto show landscape has definitely changed over the past couple years. You'll see other things filling in. A lot of the really high-end brands you saw were like a dealership supercar gallery. So we did get to see McLarens and Lamborghinis and Rolls Royces and such, but it's just a slightly different feel. There's a lot more of these kind of test drive experiences too. Ford has their Bronco thing where they take you up and down. There's a lot of EV test driving experiences where you get to ride along and all those type of things there too. So it's definitely evolving and changing. It's always cool to come see what is on display, what is coming this year, um, maybe some vehicles that I've already seen, uh, some vehicles that I haven't seen yet. And we'll finish out with the couple cars that are right behind me. We've got an RWB Porsche 993 and 918 Spider. That is owned by a friend of mine. We did a review on that last year, so we got to drive that exact 918. And this RWB was actually Nakai's personal car out here in the Chicago area. This is like a enthusiast collection area. Pretty cool getting to see these two. Some other uh, modified and enthusiast cars there. So with that, we will conclude this year's Chicago Auto Show vlog, taking you on a tour, showing you the coolest cars coming in 2024, what to expect across the whole range. If you're shopping for stuff, a lot of these cars I wanna spend some more time with. Get up close with them, live with them, see what they're like, share that with you guys. But I hope you enjoyed this video. Like always, thanks for watching.